Hello there. Welcome to the Week Ahead show here on IG for an in-depth look at what world events, company news and economic data releases will shape the global markets. Well, the weekends with a with a lackluster non-farm payrolls number up 151,000 in August off from the 180,000 that was forecast and way below July's upwardly revised 275,000, which means a Fed rate rise in September is now looking uh, unlikely. China hosts the G20 summit this weekend, a crucial time for the 40 world leaders. Of course, it's following the Brexit vote and it's wedged in between the US presidential election as well. They are there to discuss the conflicting issue of free trade and globalization as well as many other topics as well. And Monday is US Labor Day, which means Wall Street will be out of the game, but elsewhere traders will be back at their desks and these are the publications they'll be looking out for. So on Monday, we have a look at Australia's economy. We have a look at the unemployment data, often criticised for being deceptive, considering it includes part-time and minimal uh, hours. Uh, more to come from China. As I mentioned, China will be in the spotlight as the host of the G20 summit. We've got a raft of European services PMI, plus retail sales from France and the Eurozone. It's a week of interest rate decisions, and Australia will set the tone on Tuesday. Australia's central bank said last month that the outlook for the currency and China are key uncertainties to its growth and inflation forecasts, which were otherwise little changed. Then Germany factory orders, Europe retail PMI, Eurozone growth and US services PMI. More from Down Under on Wednesday with the GDP reading and more stats from Europe's biggest economies. We've got domestic data as well in the form of industrial production and the GDP plus Canada's interest rate decision. Now the Canadian economy shrank in the uh, second quarter as wildfires in Alberta contributed to the worst quarterly showing in seven years. Now, in its July rate decision, the Bank of Canada kept its key interest rate unchanged at 0.5%, partly due to this. Let's move on and talk about Thursday because Japan will publish its GDP. Uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin, he's currently in talks with Shinzo Abe today, uh, talk of economic and political ties to be strengthened. Another snapshot of the Australian economy there, but the biggest market moving event is that ECB interest rate decision. We're going to talk about that in just a moment or two. On Friday, it's China's uh, CPI. We look at manufacturing as well in Europe. We've got UK trade to look at as well and US inventories. OK, we're going to crack on and talk about some of the business news that's set uh, to come out next week. We've got various publications. Let's move on and see what company news there is. Then on Monday, we look at various industries, including pharmaceuticals, financials, industrials and tourism. Then on Tuesday, it's the first of the house builders there. We've got Redrow, which is a sector we're going to have a look at uh, today in the show. We've got Barclay Group as well, set to drop out of the FTSE 100 uh, after losing around 20% of its share value since the Brexit vote. Uh, this will be effective on the 19th of September. Lego as well on there. Uh, they've just uh, released a replica of the Walt Disney uh, Cinderella Castle. Then on Wednesday we look at Hargreaves which has added 13 trackers to its influential Wealth 150 fund list. Uh, Barrett, another house builder as well, has seen its shares tumble uh, and plenty of others as well with pharmaceuticals also adding to that list. Let's have a look at Thursday then because Dixon's is one of the most anticipated there. We've got Barnes & Noble as well. It's set to be opening up concept stores in 2017 with restaurants and bars to encourage people to come into their stores uh, rather than just buy the books and socialise as well. JD Weatherspoon is coming up on Friday as well. A Brexiteer company there. And let's talk about all of that because there's loads, isn't there? Um, OK, one of the biggest events of the week is actually coming out of the UK because actually people have been questioning was there an EU referendum? Did it make any difference at all? Was there a lot of fear mongering? And what was it all about? Because actually we've had some pretty healthy uh, numbers. But as I always say, it's still early days. We've got Chris Beecham right here to talk about all of this. Um, is it still early days? Because we've got a huge uh, publication coming out next week, haven't we, for the UK economy. Uh, we're going to have a list just there. August Market Services PMI. So Sterling, well in the spotlight for this. Yes, yeah, the biggest of the three PMI readings, uh, Purchasing Managers Index. It's a survey of uh, business managers within a certain sector of the economy. So last week, or rather this week from the UK, we've had uh, manufacturing yeah. and construction this morning. So the manufacturing one was a fantastic reading. It bounced up back. Everyone thought everything's doing really well. That was the effect of the weaker pound. This morning's construction data was better, 
but not as strong. It was still in contraction territory. The sector was still shrinking overall. Monday is the big one. Services PMI. This is around two thirds of the UK economy. This is being surveyed in this reading, and it's the key one. If this is getting better, we can start to say maybe there hasn't been this sort of catastrophic loss of economic activity in the months after the Brexit vote. Now, as you've mentioned, it's still probably too early to tell. In fact, I've used that phrase about six times this week because it is too early to tell with the UK economy. But it will be interesting to see if you do see a bounce. Now, with the manufacturing PMI on Thursday, you have this whopping great rally in sterling. If we look at the hourly chart on that, you can see how we'd been sort of messing around in the 131 area on the 29th, the 30th, 31st. And then yesterday, on the first day of September, there is your candle at 9.30. We jumped about 100 points or so in the exchange rate. And then we've continued to go from here. So I think if you've got another sudden surprise on that services PMI, which is expected to be fairly uninspiring, but might actually be expectations, uh, then you could see this new rally in sterling start to gather pace. It's definitely, I think, for the UK, the one to watch next week. OK, another one to watch has got to be the ECB um, meeting. Now, economists polled by Reuters believe that the ECB will leave their policy unchanged, although they do believe an extension to their asset purchasing programme will happen by the end of 2016. What do you think? Well, it is quite possible, really, because you you had a weaker inflation number from the Eurozone, particularly core inflation. That's the number where you take out food prices and energy prices because they bounce around quite a bit. So if mm. you take that number out and you've still got a weakness in prices, because remember, what's been pushing down inflation in the last couple of years has been the oil price. So that's been pushing down prices overall, leading to deflation or potential deflation in the Eurozone. So if you take that out of the equation and prices are still going down, then you've got a big problem. It's what Japan's had for the past 20 years or so. Um, so that's what's really worrying the Eurozone and especially the ECB. They've done their best to get things moving, to get inflation moving higher, which is the aim of every central bank and their mother at the moment, is to get inflation moving higher. And so their worry is they're not doing enough. They might have to do more. They might have to expand QE. They might even cut further into negative territory for interest rates, although they've debated the wisdom of that. So there's a lot to play for. You've got Eurozone GDP next week as well. So that will play into the equation as well if things aren't moving correctly. Now, the ECB has its work cut out. Not only have you got the UK voting to leave the European Union, you've got a big Italian referendum in November when Matteo Renzi has essentially staked his job on getting these reforms to the Italian constitution through. And if they don't work, it's everything's off the table for Italy. And you've got a Spanish election potentially coming at some point. We don't know when. So everything is in flux at the moment in the Eurozone. So everything's on the ECB to try and keep things ticking over. So if the best way to do that is by uh, increasing QE, then you can expect that to weigh directly on the currency. So if we look at the euro, we're trading at 112 against the dollar at the moment. We're off the lows of the week. If you look at the chart, we were down at around 111.30 a couple of days ago. Now, non-farms have just come out. That's pushed the US dollar down, and so the euro has recovered over the last couple of days. But people are still saying, yes, but what happens if the ECB throws the kitchen sink at the situation and massively eases? That might push the euro down. So it's going to be a volatile week, I think, for eurozone currencies, for the, of the ECB and for the euro especially. And you've got those final services PMIs on Monday. So it is going to be a heck of a week for the eurozone. Oh, it really will. OK, let's go back and talk about the EU referendum then, because we've got the house builders coming out. We've got the list just here. We've got red drone there, Barclay, Barrett's development. So they really are in the spotlight. And we'll get more clarification as to how they've reacted to the Brexit. Yeah, uh, house builders have been an interesting trade the last couple of years. Now, a year ago, or indeed at the beginning of this year, we were looking at house builders and saying they're starting to look expensive. They had a fantastic run from the lows of the crisis, people buying them up like there's no tomorrow, house price growth continues apace, and then Brexit came along and they got absolutely smashed real declines in the house price. If you look at the sector, and this is the IG sector bet you've got on the chart there, you can see this massive gap down you had on Brexit day, whopping fall in the price. Since then, they've recovered spectacularly, but a lot of them are still off uh, their price levels we saw earlier in the year. And I think now, they start to look a bit more exp uh, a bit more cheap, really, from where they were. But previously, they are expensive. But now we think, well, actually, unless you think apocalypse is going to happen in the UK housing market, mm. and clearly it isn't, and, well, probably not, or catastrophe is going to hit, then... Well, we thought it was. Then we thought we might happen. You might get, actually get a fall in house prices, shock horror, that you've never had in the UK for years. But uh, if you think that it won't be as bad as people feared, then actually they start to look quite uh, cheap, really, relative to previous earnings. Ten times earnings for some of the likes of... 
Barclay Group, Barrett Developments, Persimmon, all these start to look actually quite attractive because you think, well, house prices seem to be holding up fairly well, people still need to buy them, they're not building enough, let's be honest, and they're sitting on these huge land banks that they can just keep building on without even needing to buy more land, and they're paying a decent dividend. So from looking to be one of the more expensive sectors eight, nine months ago, mm -hmm. house builders, even with the uncertainty that goes with the UK economy at the moment, actually look quite compelling. So that's definitely one to watch out for this week. Mm. And even if you're not invested in them, it's a barometer, isn't it, for the UK economy? Um, I want to mention next week we've got loads of interest rate decisions because obviously we've got the ECB, we've also got Canada and Australia weighing in too. Um, what's going to set the tone there next week out of all of it? Well, it is clear that we're still thinking about what will the Fed do, and today's non-farm payrolls have really mm -hmm. suggested that we won't get a September rate hike. They could still surprise us, but it looks fairly unlikely. So dollar weakness has started to prevail, so that means uh, US uh, stock markets have looked a bit better. Things like the, the pound starting to rise as well, thanks to a little weakness, so that should drive it. With the RBA, you might get further comments over how they see their position vis-a-vis -vis the Asian economies. That's been a question of weakness over the last couple of months. And the Bank of Canada, of course, uh, oil prices. And they've been falling. That will hit Canadian GDP. That will hit Canadian growth. Will they start to think about easing, perhaps, or cutting the interest rate? Neither of them are expected to move. But at the moment, it's going to be the policy comments that go with those two meetings to see how that drives the currencies. All right. Well, thank you very much. That's Chris Beach in there, uh, taking us through all of next week's main events. And of course, it kicks off in China because they are hosting the G20 summit. And I did mention earlier as well, on Monday, it's Labor Day in the US. So enjoy that if you are indeed off for the day. Otherwise, we'll see you here 7.30 a.m. on Monday morning. Goodbye.